So welcome back and welcome to the keynote opening round table. We're delighted to have with us today four cutting edge scholars to inaugurate the Pop-Up Institute. Uh, they join us today uh, from four different countries and time zones and three different disciplines. They'll engage in a discussion directly covering at least four of our research clusters, um, which Neville and I and Ali just described. Um, in case you're just joining us anew, um, you can read about the clusters on our website and Sarah Eliason will put in the chat now or when she has a moment, um, a link to that part of the website. Um, so Aaron Beninov will focus today on AI and technology, Adele Blackett on care work, Juan De Lara on essential work, and Prabhakotiswaran on work across the global south. Although as you'll see in our discussion, their work cro crosses over a variety of clusters, um, which will make for a great uh, discussion. Now I'll introduce them and the idea of the round table in a moment. Uh, but first, I just some basic information on the Zoom meeting. So as I mentioned, we did make this a Zoom meeting as opposed to a webinar um, and have done so with all of our events to try to make them more interactive. Um, and uh, so that they can also, so that the people in the audience during Q&A can speak uh, if they like uh, directly, although, um, and, uh, and ask your questions yourselves. Um, for now, though, we would like to ask everyone except the roundtable participants to turn off your cameras um, and please ensure that your mics are muted. Uh, during the roundtable, you should feel free to type general comments to everyone in chat. So if there's a particular point that resonates and you want to um, shout it out um, or one that doesn't and you want to disagree, you should feel free to do that. Um, since we aren't all great multitaskers, um, though, I would encourage you to send any questions for the panelists uh, directly to me. Um, and if you'd like to ask a question in person, um, please put, and we'll do this at the end, but please put an asterisk at the start of the question, um, which is basically saying, let me speak. Um, and then it would be great if you could say who the question is for um, and its general topic. So Sarah will give an example, she just did, and we're glad to see you, Juan, welcome. Um, and she doesn't have the question for you yet, don't worry, um, but that would be an example of saying, I'd like to speak um, and ask Juan de Lara my question about pandemic capitalism. Um, if you're watching from YouTube, uh, and I know a number of people are, uh, please enter your questions in the YouTube chat, and uh, we have a student team member who will pass them along to me. So back to our speakers. Uh, as I said, this is the Rappaport's second time to welcome each of them. Um, indeed, they've been central to the Pop-Up Institute and heard about it when they first came um, because each spoke last fall in our Rappaport Center Colloquium, which is also part of an interdisciplinary seminar that we teach in the law school and that Michelle Kahn and I taught together. The seminar was entitled Inequality, Labor, and Human Rights, The Future of Work in the Age of Pandemic. And knowing that we would be doing the Pop-Up Institute, we sat down and we thought about who are the four people we are most eager to hear from to help us analyze critically some of the assumptions and prognoses of much of the future of work discussion. And these were our four. Fortunately, they all said yes, and each came and engaged, some of you were there, um, in a public Zoom two-hour session with faculty respondents from UT, um, as well as students in the seminar. But they came sequentially. So while we got to see them all, um, they didn't get to see each other. Um, and we had many discussions in the class and among the pop-up researchers about the various ways in which their talks spoke to each other. And we fantasized many great conversations among them, um, but we thought that they'd probably do even a better job um, of, of having those conversations. And so we asked them to come together and speak to each other, if only virtually. Um, 
And so once again, we asked, and once again, they all quite generously uh, said yes, and we're so delighted that they are all here with us today. Um, so I confess that it was only, so when we wrote them, we said, oh, and if you say you'll come, of course, we'll invite you back. And we thought we'll invite you back in person. Um, and that's what we said in June. Um, but we hadn't really quite, I confess, realized the extent to which their talks overlap so nicely with the various clusters. And my guess is that that's not coincidental. Um, so their work on work and livelihood does divide neatly along the lines of our clusters, but also, as you'll see, they, they, many of them touch on more than one cluster. Um, but we asked them to focus on one here, at least at the beginning, and then we'll start to have the conversation. So it turns out that alphabetically, they also line up with our clusters alphabetically. That I could say was truly coincidental, um, but it does make it easy for me to introduce them in that order. Now, in the interest of maximizing our time to hear from them, um, Sarah Eliason will drop their complete bios. I'm sure it's not their complete bios, but ones that we have um, into the chat. Um, but I'll say something about what they'll be doing here today and, and how we see their work connected. So Aaron Beninov is a postdoctoral researcher at Humboldt University of Berlin. He's an economic historian whose research interests include 19th and 20th century global economic history, economic development, labor market dynamics, unemployment, and inequality. He spoke to us last fall on part of his then forthcoming book. So that's part of what's fun too. You've all done terrific things since you were here. Um, and uh, it's since been published by Verso in November, 2020, titled Automation and the Future of Work. Since then, he's continued to publish, as have all. His most recent article, though, I think is worth mentioning, Technology-Focused Solutions Won't Work. That's the name of it, the title of it. And it appeared in May 2021. Um, he also has a forthcoming book entitled A World Without Work, Surplus Populations in the World Economy. Adele Blackett is Professor of Law and Canada Research Chair in Transnational Labor Law and Development as well as founder and director of the Labor Law and Development Research Laboratory at McGill University. She teaches and researches in the areas of labor and employment law, trade regulation, law and development, and critical race theory. Last fall, she spoke to us on a draft of an article called Slavery is Not a Metaphor, U.S. Prison Labor and Racial Subordination Through the Lens of the ILO's Abolition of Forced Labor Convention. Um, which has just been published this month. So congratulations on that, Adele. Um, we've asked her today to focus on care work, um, at least at the beginning of the conversation, stemming in part from her award-winning 2019 book, Everyday Transgressions, Domestic Workers' Transnational Challenge to International Labor Law. Juan de Lara is Associate Professor in American Studies and Ethnicity, and director of the Latinx and Latin American Studies Center at the University of Southern California. A geographer by training, he researches and writes on social justice and social movements, urban political economy, race and ethnicity, Latinx geographies, and labor. He spoke to us in the fall, partly about his 2018 book, Inland Shift, Race, Space, and Capital in Inland Southern California which uses Southern California's logistics economy to examine how modern capitalism was both shaped by and helped to transform the region's geographies of race and class. And he connected to that work to what was then a relatively new project um, he'd been engaged in on essential work and pandemic capitalism, which we asked him to begin his, uh, his remarks on today. Prabhakota Swaran is professor of law and social justice at King's College London. She researches and writes in the areas of criminal law, transnational criminal law, feminist legal studies, and sociology of law, and much more. Uh, much of her work considers the criminal regulation of work in the informal economy in India, including in the context of sex work and surrogacy. An example of some of that work is her award-winning uh, book uh, from 2011 entitled Dangerous Sex, Invisible Labor, Sex Work and Law in India. 
She spoke to us in the fall about the valuation of domestic labor in India, and that's work she's been continuing, um, including in discussions about the pandemic. Because much of her work is about India in a global context, we asked her to be, begin her remarks with discussion of the future of work across the global South. So that's our lineup. And to begin the discussion, in the order of the, uh, in which I introduced you all, um, I'd like to ask you each to start by talking to us for four to five minutes about how your work, basically the work related to the clusters we asked you to focus on, um, or how your work relates to them, and perhaps saying what you see as the biggest challenge or question in relation to that cluster topic. Um, so we'll just go in the alphabetical order this round that I started, uh, beginning with Anne. Thank you all for being here. Okay, great. And uh, thank you, Karen, for inviting me. I'm really uh, honored to be on a panel with such distinguished scholars. And I guess I'll just speak very briefly about um, AI and uh, the future of work. So I, um, I recently published a book on automation in the future of work, which is a slight, you know, related title, automation, AI, typically used as synonyms, but obviously um, some difference there. Uh, and it's clear, you know, that we, we live in an age where at least we're talking all the time about uh, brilliant technologies that have already come online and that appear to be coming online in the near future. That includes, of course, the internet, ubiquitous smartphones and social media, but also uh, advanced forms of robotics, um, artificial intelligence, especially like machine and deep learning and neural networks, and of course, um, the emerging platform economy. And while these technologies have been coming online, we've also seen a number of disturbing labor market trends. We've seen um, higher average levels of unemployment and so-called jobless recoveries. Of course, uh, we live, we're living right now in a, in a time when we've seen the highest unemployment rate since uh, the Great Depression, although of course not directly related to automation, obviously. Um, we're also seeing higher rates of underemployment, and, uh, pervasive economic insecurity, which has had very different effects on people um, across the labor market, especially uh, racialized populations, less educated populations, and so on. And we're living in a time of rising inequality. So the big question is, what are the connections between these emergent technologies and these disturbing labor market trends? How are they connected to one another? And one of the starting points for my book was this explosion of uh, discourse around this topic. Um, people pointing out that, you know, uh, these new technologies essentially were responsible for what's going on. There's a very famous study by uh, Frey and Osborne in 2013 that seemed to say that 47% uh, percent of all jobs that exist today were going to be automated in some future time horizon, which wasn't specified. Uh, and studies since then have really shown that um, on a closer examination, those numbers turn out to be a little bit ambiguous, but a lot of jobs that um, Frey and Osborne thought would be automated were actually going to be transformed but not fully um, automated away. And at the same time, we've seen a number of um, really important studies by other social scientists showing that new technologies are being implemented in ways that use a lot of labor and that rely on a lot of insecure labor for their operations, whether that's in the platform economy or um, all the kind of hidden labor behind apparently automated processes like content moderation, for example, on social media. And we've seen a lot of talk of digital forms of surveillance, of algorithmic management and control, and so on that point to a very disturbing future in which there will be a lot of work to be done, but uh, workers will find their autonomy really snatched away from them. So my work's really focused on some of the broader conditions that have made for bad work in the digital age. It's not just a story. I think we can't just talk about labor in the digital economy and the future of AI and automation and so on. We have to look at the broader economic conditions into which this new digital economy is inserted. And I think um, some really important points to note are um, the paradox that, that this age of really new technologies has also been an era of um, pretty significant economic slowdown, what economists have been calling secular stagnation, that we live in a stagnating economy in spite of the apparent 
rapid change in um, technology. And then in fact, um, economic statistics suggest that instead of rapid labor productivity growth, which we would expect to see if all of these workers were being replaced with machines and the remaining workers were um, producing more and more per hour, uh, instead of that, we're seeing really a slowdown in productivity growth. And so big questions are like, why is this slowdown happening? Um, but in any case, my, my view is that um, the slowing growth, as well as the efforts states have made to try to restore growth in this era of stagnation, are really responsible for a more general condition of, it, of insecurity, which is also why insecurity pervades so much of the digital economy. I'm very doubtful of the PR claims that um, Silicon Valley executives make about their technologies and the capabilities that are about to come online. And I think that um, more and more scholars in the era of this kind of tech lash are similarly doubting those claims and trying to figure out what's really going on with work in the economy today. I think as um, Karen mentioned, there's a lot of reasons to believe that work in the digital, in the future will look a lot like uh, work already in the past and the present. And so um, I guess, you know, running out of time here already with a very short uh, uh, initial presentation, I think that um, some other big questions we need to investigate, which link to the other panels, is like, what does the future of the digital economy look like globally, not just in rich countries like the United States? Um, what kinds of technology, what kinds of transformations that we've seen during the pandemic are really going to continue into the post-pandemic age, which may or not be um, coming up on our horizon? Uh, and also, you know, not, I think we should be talking not only about the harms that um, people are experiencing within the digital economy today, but also what the possibilities are for a very different world um, that new technologies afford. So I'll just uh, leave it at that and, um, and turn it over to the other panelists. Thank you so much. Great, uh, terrific way to get this into the conversation. Adele, wanna to talk to us about care work? Great, uh, so uh, thank you very much. Uh, Karen and team for the invitation to come back. And I uh, just wanted to express my gratitude for the care and thought that's put into fostering ongoing conversations around, around these themes. So the theme I've been asked to speak to is work and care. And uh, I tend to start by underscoring invisibility. First, the invisibility of the work, right? Cooking, cleaning, taking care of children, uh, and others who uh, require support. Uh, the work is often unpaid and when it's paid, it is usually poorly paid. Uh, the work is perpetual. It is boundaryless. There are few artifacts. Uh, a clean child is not clean for long. Uh, the work is unseen until it is undone. Uh, and uh, I often turn to a, a domestic worker uh, of Moroccan heritage in France, Fatima Layoubi, about whom a wonderful uh, uh, film was produced uh, a few years ago. Um, and she referred to her own work as art, but that transpires through her very body, takes from her body uh, as she works you know, long hours every day, seven days a week to make ends meet. Uh, but it's her ability to underscore uh, how unseen that work is and how seen, unseen she is as a worker in that work uh, that is crucial. And so of course there is uh, very significant theorizing about the care economy. I wanna focus um, in light of my discipline on uh, the way that uh, we think about the law of the household workplace, the normative order that thinking about care, paid or unpaid in this manner um, 
uh, holds in place and then the ways in which the workers who do that work uh, challenge uh, their own uh, invisibilization, right? Insist on being seen, insist on challenging uh, the normative order uh, that um, is, uh, uh, they're expected to operate within. Uh, so the women, as I've alluded to in the example of Fatima El Ayubi, racialized, gendered, nationality does a lot of work here in respect of global migration. Um, and what is striking um, is that although much of the uh, early care economy work emphasized uh, the relationship between uh, reproductive labor to so-called productive labor um, and, uh, uh, and the framing uh, through the household economy, there was an erasure of the very specificity of those required to work, uh, either enslaved, so without pay, uh, or uh, poorly paid, and that is the racialization. If the household economy model holds, it holds uh, in a particular understanding of uh, those held in servitude in that relationship. And until we grapple with the ways in which uh, that uh, subordination uh, it remains embodied in the workers, we will not properly unravel uh, the uh, disparity in pay uh, that accompanies that work. So deeply intersectional work and part of what remains invisible and must be challenged. Uh, that racialization, that gendering uh, then inscribes certain understandings of the law that governs the workplace. The worker is not to be seen. The worker is not to be heard. The worker's needs are not to be seen, are not to be taken into account. Sometimes this seemed a little remote and hard to explain. And here's where I intersect with the next speaker. The pandemic has placed this invisibility so squarely before us. We actually talk about essential workers, uh, those who literally keep our markets going and keep us alive. And yet the consequence isn't to say, therefore they need decent working conditions. They require social justice, but instead, we can take, we can expect uh, these workers to put themselves at risk to their lives, to their families' lives. And there's such deep continuity uh, in that, in the way that we think about the subordinated service of care workers. And so if I may bridge with Aaron's presentation, it really is that old forms of uh, work and understandings of the relationship of workers to the economy and to our legal regimes um, retain uh, their vitality and transform themselves in new contexts, but they don't really disappear. And, and so we need to understand the underlying subordination. Thanks. Great. Um, I think that Adele just gave you the segue, Juan. Thank you so much, Karen and uh, Neville for inviting me again. And I'm happy to see you all. And thank you, Adele, for that lovely uh, segue. Uh, and Aaron, I'm really enjoying your book. So, so I'm, I'm happy to read that. Um, I think that one of the, I just want to start well with um, the point that Adele just made, which is that the, this idea that the pandemic made essential workers visible. Um, 
And I think that, you know, if you, we read through uh, what Adele was also saying is that, of course, these workers have always been there and that these workers have always been essential uh, to the work of capitalism. Um, and it's just a question of understanding that in, in particular kinds of historical uh, moments that these workers are placed in precarious conditions and especially during a place, a time like can, uh, pandemic that we're living through now that sort of the pandemic creates these situations that, that make their work and their lives even more precarious than they have been in the past. Right. And so to understand that uh, and that, you know, one, when 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 I talk about essential workers, um, what I'm one of the points that I'm making is that that this is not an exceptional concept, that pandemic, that essential workers are not only essential during the time of pandemic uh, capitalism or during the time of a pandemic, that essential workers, you know, have been. Uh, the life and blood of the way that capitalism has established itself as a global system uh, throughout generations. And so I want to just sort of very quickly talk over three, talk about three different points that I think connect and explain my approach, both to what I said when I first joined um, you all, Karen, and talked about essential workers, and then some of the prompts that you sent me in terms of possible questions that you might ask me for today. Um, and, and I just want to begin by sort of focusing on that phrase, essential capitalism. What does that mean? Um, and when when I speak about is a uh, pandemic capitalism, sorry, I, when I speak about pandemic capitalism, I'm, I want to make sure that we pay attention to three particular issues. One is the pervasiveness of capitalism, right? That written into the logics of capitalism is a demand for growth uh, and accumulation. So pervasiveness is key to understanding, you know, how, how pandemic capitalism works. And closely tied to that is this idea that capitalism has always been global. That part of the work that has been done, especially by scholars in the global south, is to destabilize the mythos of capitalism as the product of an enlightenment project, right? That is based on rationality and liberal democracy. That instead of thinking about capitalism as uh, an equivalent to freedom and liberty that we should think about how capitalism has been built on global imperialism and on the blood, land, and labor of racialized bodies, right? And so the third point, so we talked about pervasiveness written into the logics of growth, glo globalism, that capitalism in fact has always been imperial uh, and, and extractive, and then the third part is to think about pandemic capitalism as deadly, um, a, as a way to think about how the essential or this idea that workers or resources are essential to the growth of global capitalism provides a rationale for uh, people and places to be rendered as sacrificial, right, in particular places. And, and one of the things that I've been focusing on in, in this idea, in this sort of work that I've been doing on logistics and essential workers during the time of the pandemic is the way that the state has, has created the regulatory frameworks that have enabled precarious labor uh, to function, right? Uh, and for the production of disposable communities, disposable workers, et cetera, that we have to understand, again, not the exceptional process or the exceptional moment of a pandemic, but in fact, how this is part and parcel of the logics of global capitalism, right? And so in my particular work, I focused a lot on thinking about the regulatory frameworks that have consistently created what Ruth Wilson Gilmore calls the anti-state state, in which the defunding of the regulatory apparatus of the state means that there are less resources, less funds available for places to be monitored. For example, much of the work that's happened around the expansion of places like Amazon and Walmart and these global retailers who use logistics workers in these warehouses, um, one of the things that's been pretty clear to me in my research is that 
this is able to happen. Workers are, are hurt uh, because of the rigorous uh, quota systems that are implemented by companies like Amazon and Walmart. Uh, but also within the workplace, many workers um, are not actually enjoying the benefits of a regulated labor system. They don't have the same kinds of labor protections, not because the protections don't exist in law, but because the state has been, has been so disarmed, right, um, by defunding that there aren't enough inspectors to go in and regulate and monitor and make sure that workers are actually safe on the job. Um, and it's only in moments in places like in California where you know, progressive groups have organized and really forced the regulatory state to enforce the existing laws where we see state officials going in, inspecting these places, and then you know, fining companies millions and millions of dollars because of the kinds of health and safety violations that are routine uh, and a regular part of everyday life uh, at the job uh, for companies like Walmart and Amazon. And so this idea, again, of pandemic capitalism is to think about, it's, I don't, it's not a new thing, but what it is, it's a way to frame capitalism the way that it always has been, which is pervasive, which is global, and which is also deadly, right? Um, and so I think about the pervasiveness of precarity, uh, the, the globality of understanding how uh, some uh, economies have used both biophysical resources, in, meaning labor and natural resources as systems of accumulation and growth, right? This is the whole foundation of world systems theory. Um, and of course, thinking about the deadly consequences of the expansion of pandemic capitalism. And, and I'll just end here with, with saying that part of the project that I engage in and why I insist on talking about capitalism in this way is because I don't think that we can talk about capitalism without talking about imperialism and without talking about racialization. And I will also add, of course, to this heteropatriarchy, right? And so we understand capitalism in these contexts, within these terms. And frankly, I think that, you know, yes, we can talk about racial capitalism, but I actually prefer just to talk about capitalism and understand that when I say capitalism, I mean capitalism in this kind, kind of pandemic sense, but also in this kind of racial capitalism sense, right? That we understand the global infrastructures, the global relationships of power that have always been present in the expansion and development of capitalist systems. Thank you very much. Great, uh, thank you Juan. And um, in a little bit, I wanna get others to think too about uh, the different, th the theoretical underpinnings and how they're similar and different, different from the ones you just described. Um, Prabha, uh, there, there is still much left to be said. Uh, so I think everyone's talked on, about at some level or touched upon work across the global South, um, but uh, we'll, we'll give you a chance to dive in a bit more. Wonderful, thank you so much, Karen and Neville for this invitation. And it's, it's um, as Aaron said, it's a real privilege to you know, uh, share this space with uh, all of you uh, wonderful, brilliant scholars. So yeah, I mean, you know, I, I, so what I'm about to say will have some overlap with what uh, Adele has said and what Juan has said. Um, so, but also there are some differences. So I think, you know, I'll, I'll kind of speak about both the similarities and the differences. So my research is on women's work in the global South context of India. And I'm particularly interested in looking at social reproduction. You know, I use the, the vocabulary of social reproduction rather than of care, but really social reproduction involves um, the labor uh, inherent in biological reproduction and voluntary work in the reproduction of culture and ideology and uh, the provision of uh, a range of services, sexual, emotional, and affective. So in a sense, it, it very much overlaps with what Adele has told us in terms of you know, certain characteristics of care work, of reproductive labor. And as she rightly pointed out, I think earlier on, there was uh, early literature in this area really spoke about the connection between reproductive labor and productive labor. But I think even there, uh, the, the missing link was to look at reproductive labor, which was performed for the market, which is something that feminists didn't necessarily embrace early on. So I'm really thinking here about 
you know, forms of reproductive labor that span the market marriage continuum. And that's what I'm really interested in. So the question is, the challenge has been for feminists to uh, agree on whether there are certain forms of reproductive labor performed for the market, whether they can ever be work. Um, so as, as um, Karen has already mentioned, uh, I've been looking at a range of market-based forms of reproductive labor, including sex work, erotic dancing, um, and commercial surrogacy, which are often characterized as some form of violence uh, and therefore subject to carceral state responses. Uh, and when it comes to paid domestic work, of course, it's a, a story of, of utter uh, neglect and precarity. Um, so the goal is really for me to start from women's lived experiences uh, on what they think of as work and then map some of the existing discourses of such work, including by women workers themselves, because they perform a lot of boundary work when they're trying to destigmatize certain forms of work. And when we come to the marriage side of the continuum, I think there is uh, unpaid domestic and care work, which actually, as all, all the speakers have said, the pandemic has really sharply rendered visible as being quite fundamental to any kind of paid work that, might, that we might do for the economy, but also just to the sustenance of life itself. Uh, but even here, I think, you know, unpaid domestic and care work is seen as detracting from valuable work. So in the context of the global south, um, and particularly here, I'm thinking of India, um, there is a serious problem, quote unquote, of declining female labor force participation rates. And this is posed as a problem by several international organizations and donor bodies who explain this declining labor force participation in terms of the burdens of unpaid care and domestic work, and then is explained away in terms of, you know, cultural factors and, you know, backwardness of some sort or the other. Um, so, of course, the problem here, you know, we need to turn it around, um, you know, turn it on its head to say that actually uh, the problem is not just that, you know, women perform disproportionate amounts of unpaid work, but really they also perform unpaid economic activities which are not recognized by the state as work, uh, when you think of your know, census and labor force surveys and so on. So what is that, um, uh, the core of this uh, discussion is really what is work and who gets to call, uh, you know, terms certain forms of economic activity as work. Um, so, and here I just want to say a little bit about, you know, because uh, everyone has spoken a little bit about the law, I just want to also sound uh, a note of uh, optimism, which is that, you know, when we think, of, when we try and dislodge and query these hegemonic ways of thinking about women's work, we also need to appreciate the contingency of the rule networks that shape them. So actually one of the things that I uh, discussed uh, in my paper uh, uh, last, uh, in the fall, was really around how a common law rule around compensation for loss of life under tort law was radically reinterpreted by Indian courts. So, you know, typically uh, when a homemaker died, um, you know, her, uh, there would be compensation for her family in terms of, you know, loss of love and affection, loss of consortium. Sometimes courts don't award any compensation because they simply think that her work within the home is a, is a labor of love and therefore, you know, it should not be commodified. But what Indian courts did was to really take this common law rule uh, and uh, reinterpret it in a way uh, that they read women's unpaid domestic and care work in terms of loss of services. So they brought it under a pecuniary category of compensation and then viewed it as an occupation effectively so that they could assign a monthly payment for it and then you know, multiply it over uh, you know, the, the lifespan of the woman. So there is this very interesting way in which women's unpaid work uh, has been recognized by Indian courts and uh, is at the tipping point of being constitutionalized. So we can constitutionalize this recognition of social reproduction. So I'll say a little bit about work in the global South now in terms of challenges. And I think the main challenge really is um, apart from uncovering this, you know, this literature around what, what, what do we mean by work? is trying to understand the complex and shifting terrain of relations between the state labor and capital. And here, obviously, you know, uh, the global South, many parts of the global South have been subject to neoliberal economic policies through structural adjustment policies. But what is paradoxical is certainly in the case of India is not a retraction of the welfare state. If anything, there's been an expansion of the welfare state with the advent of neoliberal capitalism, including through quite radical redistributive programs such as employment guarantee schemes, 
and laws that institutionalize socioeconomic rights, such as the right to education and food security. So I guess if anyone trying to understand work in this global South context has to confront this paradox, really. And one way in which it has been explained is that gains from the formal corporate sector or what is termed as the accumulation economy will be routed through the welfare state to those in the informal economy or who are in the need economy uh, to ensure political legitimacy. And often we find that workers also subscribe to this understanding uh, by resorting to what Rina Agarwala calls social movement unionism, where they don't necessarily negotiate with their employers, but they really negotiate with the state uh, for meeting their reproductive needs in terms of you know, housing, um, education, uh, and health. So of course, you know, the shifts due to the pandemic and India is still in the throes of the, the second wave um, has simply meant that, you know, this bargain between the state and capital and labor has undergone yet again another shift and it's too soon to say what this might look like. But all we know, you know, is that estimates say that 200 million people are now below the poverty line compared to earlier. So 200 million more people being under the poverty line and the migration of workers back to rural areas from the urban areas because they simply cannot meet their reproductive needs in the urban areas. Um, so these are massive job losses, both for women and for men. So the question is, how do we reimagine work um, in the post-pandemic period? Thanks. Well, I think you all have stated enough challenges for us to deal with for three weeks. Um, <laughs> and uh, hopefully we'll be able to continue beyond that. Uh, so thank you all very much uh, for touching on many issues that we've been thinking about a lot and, and some new ones as well. Uh, I, I, I'm going to encourage, I think the best way to have, I'd like to have a little bit of discussion among you all because I know, um, and I really appreciate the way you've brought in your responses to the speakers before you as well. So uh, Prabha, obviously I, I was going to ask you about your focus um, on, on domestic work and unpaid work and the various uh, calls for reform that you've been engaged with. But I wanna stick with the Global South for a moment. Um, and, and I, because I heard a tension between Juan's discussion, or, or maybe it's it's not a tension, but he, he talked about the anti-state state, state um, in the United States. And you talk about um, the expanding social welfare state in the global South. And I'd like to pull in Aaron a little bit on this because I think sometimes you've had Aaron, you've suggested that actually there is no welfare, there's much less of a welfare state in the global South. And of course, these are huge categories and they depend on what North and what South we're thinking about. Um, but uh, really all of your work touches on um, the role of the global South and the kinds of economic um, policies uh, and that you discuss. And maybe I'll just ask the others, the easiest thing, you could either raise your hand when you wanna jump in or you can send me a chat and say, I'd like to speak to so-and-so about such and such. Um, so this is for the participants now and I'd be happy to, to do that. So Aaron. Oh, so, uh, sorry, what, um, you just want me to respond to the other, or uh, uh, respond to what you were saying. Uh, sorry. sorry. Okay, and, and sorry, I meant to say for the panelists to send me your, when you want to jump in. Uh, I, I thought that it would, you might have a different, a different take on the welfare state in the global south, mm -hmm. or at least in some parts of the global south, as well as, as the global north, um, yeah. from, from, anti-state state idea. Yeah, I think it's, I think these are really fascinating questions. And of course the welfare state has many different components, right? And, and we've seen them maybe move in contradictory ways as well um, with states introducing some, especially in the global South, um, conditional cash transfers and other forms of cash-based welfare programs while at the same time trying to like flexibilize labor markets and introducing security in different ways into different sectors of the market. So I think it's really complicated. And I think that those complications have to do, I actually really thought what um, Prabha said about uh, the development of the welfare state in the global South and the kinds of um, efforts on the part of political parties to kind of draw some of the wealth being accumulated in the corporate sector 
towards the rest of the population in order to, to support their own kind of um, political fortunes. I think we're just seeing a lot of contradictory dynamics because I think the other, the two sides of it are on the one hand, the need to kind of get mass votes and on the other hand, the need to support um, ongoing accumulation in, in incredibly difficult economic times. I mean, we've just seen in the course of the past 20 years, two once in a lifetime global economic crises, right? And um, I think that, you know, I guess what I focus on in my work is the way that, um, especially in turbulent economic times when corporate actors are able to sort of say, we're not sure that we can invest in this environment. We're concerned about investment possibilities. We're concerned about a bad business climate. Um, governments have been forced, whether they are, you know, I mean, look at the long history of social democratic governments in Europe. Look at the German Social Democratic Party implementing all of these hard sphere reforms in 2004 that really um, reduced workers' access to unemployment benefits. So even parties that nominally are parties that are supposed to support the working class find that they kind of have to, um, they have to support uh, businesses, they have to support or try to convince um, wealthy individuals and corporations to invest in the economy. And they often end up doing that in different ways at the expense of maybe sections of the workforce um, and so on. So I think we're just seeing a lot of contradictory trends that have to be analyzed and trying to pick out the global uh, story while also paying attention to um, north-south divides and regional divides and so on. I think it's a really interesting time. I thought something that really connected across the different speakers that I thought was really interesting is just about the limit related to this topic is like the limits of the regulatory state and the ways that sometimes um, what we see is that when the state, even when the state tries to regularize certain conditions, like for example, offering unemployment benefits or something like that, um, it can often cause large parts of the economy to kind of disappear from those, from you know, like a lot efforts at regulation sometimes to have contradictory effects as parts of the economy sort of withdraw from visibility to the state. Um, in various ways. And, you know, that's as much about individuals trying to survive at the bottom of the labor market in the global economy as it is about business strategies that prey on all kinds of vulnerable people at the bottom of the labor market. So I think, yeah, in different ways, I guess I'm really interested in questions that were raised about visibility and invisibility, um, the limitations both of the regulatory state and the statistical apparatus to kind of measure what's really going on under those conditions and maybe just the general kind of um, the difficult um, environment for investment that's put a lot of power in the hands of the investment class and subordinated a lot of, um, a lot of what governments can, you know, might be able to do in some abstract sense um, to these complicated articulations of um, business needs and the need to kind of create jobs and so on in, in a very difficult economic environment. So I'll stop there, but I found uh, what, I, what all of you said is very, uh, uh, the other panelists said very interesting. And I guess I'm, yeah, looking for connections of which there are actually quite quite a lot in what we're doing. So thank you. Um, yeah, and I'd say a lot of what we're focusing on in other events uh, that are sort of connected to under the Global South, a lot of it is on labor migration. Every one of you is talking about labor migration um, and also the informal economy. Um, and which, and, and being very aware of the ways in which it operates in the global north as well as the global south, um, very much in the area in which Juan works. Um, Adele or Juan, do you all want to jump in on global south or response to care or anything, any other challenges from the clusters you'd like to point to? Adele? Uh, yeah, happy uh, to jump in very much. Uh, appreciated the comments and uh, the links and uh, one of the things I've kind of wanted to underscore, and I think it comes through beautifully in Prabha's um, presentation um, and in relation, frankly, to Juan's, is that um, in, in labor, in, when we think about work, we've tended to think about very particular patterns of social protection, of labor regulation, um, that stem from epistemic models that are very much rooted in the global north 
and its perceived relationship to the development of the rest of the world, right? And, uh, and, and other forms of work, including in the informal economy, which is of course uh, such a broad way of talking about a range of organization of livelihoods. And what comes through, you know, there's a long version of this discussion, but the short form is that we need to break from that assumption of path dependency and look very carefully, take our analytical starting points from specific places and specific groups of actors in the global south. And so the emphasis on social movement unionism capture some of that in the domestic work discussion to bring it to labor. Uh, there was such surprise that the progressive innovation on how to regulate domestic work came mostly from specific places in the global south. And here I'll just segue to the racial capitalism, capitalism discussion, because one, I very much hear you and tend to agree about claiming the broader discourse about what uh, we mean when we affirm the particular uh, <laughs> mode of production and understanding of that organization um, through capitalism um, and racial, uh, racial capitalism isn't a form, it is in its fullness an argument about how capitalism emerged and how it developed. And uh, you, you'll, you'll note that I'm quite specific about naming slavery in relation to that, um, which uh, centuries long system of economic <laughs> ordering of the world that enabled the emergence of capitalism and uh, enabled settler colonialism and uh, uh, at overlapped with the emergence of colonialism and very much was about imperialism. And, and, and so it's, it's critical to put that form of labor, of course, broader human dehumanization, but labor is really quite critical that the understanding of labor and land that comes through framing um, these matters this way allows us uh, to see so much more and to see the point that you led with, which is that um, capitalism is global. Right? So, uh, so a deep, deep interconnections here. And, and I don't think we, we, um, we don't do ourselves uh, a service unless we start the discussions with an understanding of the South and of course the South of the North and how those links then lead us to a different discussion about distribution or redistribution, right? So who the actors are in relation to work and also whether we should be thinking about um, social protection um, in, in terms of international solidarity, in terms of uh, alternative forms of distribution, which may be regional um, uh, as well, and may be woven into uh, the new legal architecture being uh, developed um, to, uh, that, that builds polities, so true regional agreements, the like. Yeah, thank you so much, um, Adele. I think that was, that was, I totally agree with you on, on that. Um, you know, it's always one of the things, because maybe it's because I'm a geographer, I always think about commodity chains and, and sort of thinking about how these things are structured on a global scale, right? Where do these resources, the, the things that go into the production of these goods, where are these things made, who is distributing them, and how are they being consumed, right? And all of the labor that's involved in each one of those steps, I think it's really critical for us to understand. But let me let me just sort of focus on one thing, and, and that's this, this question about the role of the global south and the state. And 
and I want to just highlight the way that the global south, and, and I think Adele said this, the global south or the south in the north, right? That's absolutely critical to understand the way would the way that we think about racial capitalism within the United States, right? That racialization has functioned as a way to create these exploitable, precarious uh, communities that can then be exposed to certain kinds of sacrificial labor, right? Um, so let me give you one concrete example. Um, what we know when, from the beginning, when there was legislation, um, you know, when we started talking about uh, immigration and immigration policies, the construction of those policies were based on uh, the racialization of both Asian, Chinese migrants, but also of Mexicans. Um, to the point where when there was an established process to import Mexicans for agricultural labor, they were, they were set aside. They were put in an exceptional category where they did not receive the same kinds of labor protections that other workers did, right? And this also includes, of course, the right to join unions, etc. That had to be set aside in the nation of the public, in, in the, in, for the sort of sake of the public good and the public here, meaning uh, uh, a U.S. consumer market, right, that was going to consume those goods. So from the beginning, the production of Mexican imported agricultural labor has always been tied to their production as an exploitable sacrificial labor force. And I say that because those conditions that they were exposed to, both coming to the United States, being sprayed with DDT, and then being exposed to countless pesticides and terrible living conditions and working conditions, were written into the code of, you know, the law of the state in order to, to render them usable, exploitable labor for the public good of the United States, right? So what happens during uh, this, you know, pandemic capitalism, where many of these same things are happening. For example, there were many cities that passed uh, legislation that uh, benefited uh, essential workers by giving them essential work risk pay, right? And some companies did that. Um, and in, in California, there was one city that tried to do that for farm workers. Right? I think there were actually more, but the one city that I'm involved in is because it's a city that I'm from. Uh, I grew up in the city of Coachella in Southern California. My family were farm workers. I spent a lot of time working in those fields. The city of Coachella decides that farm workers should be included in uh, the essential uh, wages uh, legislation that was passed by the local city. The Growers Association has taken them to federal court using those same federal laws saying, no, uh, farm workers are excluded from these kinds of labor protections. They represent a different class because of the interest of the federal, uh, you know, of, of the American public, right? Because they're using the same kind of infrastructure, legal infrastructure that has always created farm workers as an exploitable class, right? Um, and so this is being heard now in, in, in the court, uh, in federal court. But I raise that to say that when I'm talking about the anti-state state, this is part of what I'm talking about, the way that the state is used. And, and of course, always, and I think Aaron acknowledges it, that when we talk about the state in the United States, it is complicated because we have a federalist system in which there are many iterations of the state that is somewhat, that is very different from the centralized states and the social welfare state of Europe, et cetera, right? Um, but I think what has happened is that you know, the state, and, and here I'm talking about the local state, has always been up for political contest between the, the interest where white, you know, capitalists uh, organize in order to capture the local state, in order to produce a particular state that enables them to develop systems and labor market systems, et cetera, that allows them to grow capitalism. Final point that I want to make. That also includes regulatory laws that make these communities where workers live, not just where, where they work, but where they live, susceptible to the ravages of things like environmental injustice, right? Um, and so we can think about the, these same communities where local laws are also, we think about development, zoning, etc., where the state is actually also planned 
uh, as a way to say, well, these communities are available for these kinds of polluting systems. And so when I talk about the anti-state state, I'm also talking about that. The way that regulate, regulatory agencies are used at multiple levels, right? And here, local, regional, state, et cetera, uh, to produce these kinds of precarious, not only workplaces, but precarious communities in which people have to live their everyday lives, right? Um, so that's sort of, I just wanted to highlight what I meant about that. And, and, and when I'm also, I think the other point is that we also also need to think about the way that racialization uh, works in the historical way that ideas about race and the global north vis-a-vis -vis the global south is in play here. Because sometimes those, those relationships extend to the United States importing cheap labor from the global south, the same way that it imports um, resources from the global south in order to produce these kinds of goods. So I think that kind of wider framework is really important to understand and to recognize. Juan, well, that was, thank you for, uh, actually all of you have now segued to a question that I've been dying to ask you all. Um, and, and since your first mention of the anti-state state, Juan, state, so I think that that clarification was really useful because uh, you've, you've all mentioned law or regulation in some way in your comments. Um, and I would have said at the beginning, Juan, that you talked about law as something that was not functioning, right? When your first example of lack of particular types of occupational health safety regulation. Um, and I was going to ask, is law also part of the problem? And you just outlined beautifully a way in which law is part of the problem. Um, and Prava, you just touched upon it in your comments. You said you think we, there's reason to be optimistic about law. Um, and so I wonder if you might uh, say a little bit more about that. And, and then I'd like to ask each of you before we open it up um, to the audience for a bit, uh, I, I'd like to ask each of you to where, what you see the role of law in the, we'll say in the, in the, in, in capitalism or whatever you see as the greatest impediment to emancipation. Great. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I, I thoroughly enjoyed Juan's uh, exposition on the role of the state and, you know, uh, sort of conditioning um, uh, social reproduction, you know, how, what are the conditions of social reproduction for workers themselves? You know, that's something that we often forget. And I think he outlined very beautifully what us as legal realists would say, you know, you don't just deal with the law that you see in front of you, which is, you know, you just don't look at labor law when you think of workers, but you really think about, you know, what are the rules in the background and the rules in the background are exactly the zoning laws, which, you know, make workers live in, uh, you know, conditions that are uninhabitable, you know. So uh, I think this kind of flipping of the categories of uh, different backgrounding, different sets of rules uh, is what gives us hope, which is why, you know, uh, I made the point about contingency. But I think I just wanted to say, so law is definitely um, uh, in this, in its contingency, I think we can find opportunities for for change, uh, but I wanted to connect it back to what one said in terms of how the state operates. And uh, just to say that just as you know, you've all pointed out to the existence of the global south and the global north, um, you know, I, I wanted to say a little bit about the global north and the global south, uh, just to you know, loop, make the complete the loop um, in terms of the law. And I think also it was interesting that one talked about the federal kind of uh, the allocation of powers between different levels of government. I think it's really important, and it connects to what Adele said in terms of how some of the most innovative kind of regulatory mechanisms come came from the global south and it's not just the global south that actually comes from re, uh, from the regional level from the local level certainly in the indian context some of the best laws even the radical kind of employment guarantee scheme started out decades ago at the state level which then because of the federalist system gets copied by other states and then gets you know uh, uploaded so to speak to the federal level uh, but at the same time i think the pressures of you know, international discourse around these issues. So certainly in, in the context of labor rights, you know, and this question of trafficking, for example, there's a way in which some very uh, innovative labor laws from the global south get appropriated by a larger carceral discourse around, say, trafficking, which, you know, uh, replaces the labor law innovations with uh, criminal law dictates. And I think the global north and the global south plays a very important role in downloading some of these sort of, you know, uh, transnational castle um, mechanisms because it 
it uh, reinforces the power of the state. So I think it's just this very complex interplay of the various, of the state at the various levels and the laws at the various levels, which I think are very, um, very interesting to, to, you know, note for our purposes. Great. Um, I guess maybe I should call on the other law professor next and then, and then we'll hear from the historian. <laughs> Um, uh, so happy to go next, though. Um, my point is actually going to be a historical one. <laughs> um, as you were speaking, uh, Prabha, um, I really uh, like your framing of the, you know, the downloading of, uh, of carceral discourse. And uh, this is not new. And so coming back to the way we reframed the law of slavery, was precisely that, right? To, so, you know, uh, so law in the book, slavery is abolished, turn of the century, right? Nobody has it except <laughs> illiberal states in what we will now call the global south, um, uh, the former colonies or those resisting colonization like Abyssinia <laughs> or Ethiopia. And, and the framing was to um, draw on the model of the abolition you know, the Wilberforce rather than the centuries of basically uh, legally enforced subordination, exploitation, dehumanization. Uh, and uh, then that enabled the turning of colonial machinery onto the other. And I think we, uh, we should have we should be nimble about those moments of uh, through which the law was relied upon to shift quite fundamentally um, uh, the kind of power that would be exercised over the other, right? And 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 acknowledge um, how similar some of that uh, can be, and and. Um, uh, so, so yes, uh, uh, a deep reckoning with laws indeterminacy, uh, and um, an insistence on historicizing that um, to to underscore the point is is what characterizes the way that I I grapple with this question. And uh, I'll just add that I absolutely agree that the the specificity, taking the time to understand the specificity of law in place, then allows you to build a vision of law that flows as much through the resistances to uh, um, how, how law is being characterized, but also reads resistance into our understanding of law. So a deeply pluralist or legal pluralist understanding of how law is um, both challenged, but also constructed. Great. Um, and Erin, I know you have a lot to say about Capitalism, um, I and so I'd love to hear a little bit, get you in on this discussion about racial and pandemic capitalism, um, as well as uh, your thoughts on the role of law in that. Mm. Great, yeah. I mean, I guess one of the contexts in which I've studied this in particular is the um, erosion of labor law, really not only in the global north, but in the global south as well over the last, um, 40 or 50 years. And I guess that I think that it really shows um, in a certain sense how even under conditions in which, you know, in the middle of the 20th century, you had a real effort to kind of build up a labor regulatory framework to regularize um, employment relations, which was as much in the interests of obviously of labor as it was of capital was perceived to be at least in a certain limited way to be the interests of capital. And I'm, I'm really interested in the ways that that erosion took place. And I guess that in my view, too often, um, that, that situation is, is explained purely as a result of a kind of power struggle, like somehow in the 80s, um, you know, capital got the upper hand in the, in the kind of war between capital and labor and just started imposing all of these incredibly insecure conditions on workers. And I think what that misses is the kind of autonomy or semi-autonomy, as it were, um, of the accumulation process itself, that when accumulation starts slowing down, 
um, not only do uh, you know do business businesses suffer from uh, low profit rates, but so too do workers because hiring slows down, um, unemployment rates rise, governments uh, fear that high unemployment will um, reduce their election chances, and there's a kind of general subordination of society. It's various ends and goals um, to the need of capital. And I guess that that's why, in my view, I mean, obviously we could talk about all of the ways that law um, uh, supports a society with massive wealth inequalities and kind of structures the, the persistence of those inequalities over time, how it structures the, um, the really narrow uh, number of people who have a say over shaping the very broadest questions about our future, what kind of investments we'll make in our society, how we will reallocate resources across the economy, um, what share of resources will flow through public channels while somehow uh, really always remaining subordinated to um, the needs of private investment. And so sort of trying to transition maybe or include from a conversation about law and the possibilities of um, legal regulatory frameworks to kind of shape patterns of accumulation. I think that's definitely true, but the reverse also takes place, right? That legal frameworks are themselves in turn um, reshaped by the needs of uh, capital. And, you know, maybe just a, the most recent, you know, version of this is on the one hand, um, I was sort of surprised, I have to admit, that uh, Uber and Lyft won so handily the California AB 22, um, fight uh, and that that is now setting the stage for a kind of broader fight to really regularize massive insecurity and precarity in the platform economy, right? To write the rules in the favor of those um, companies. And also just the general way that I think we live in a time where I'm a little suspicious of a lot of the attention on AI uh, ethics frameworks today insofar as they seem to be um, basically uh, purchased by Silicon Valley, you know, um, uh, companies that are seeking to create kind of positive framework for the rollout of their technologies that are really going to be profitability based. They're trying to kind of preempt a lot of the um, criticism or trying to dampen those criticisms by creating a kind of ethical framework for discussion of that. And I guess that like, in my view, what we need to do is we need to shift you know, to a world, uh, a very different world in which, um, in which big decisions about the reshaping and shaping of our society are not only more public, because I think there's a big discussion happening now in the US around public investment, but also taking those kind of decisions out of the hands of government uh, technocrats and corporate actors um, and their influences over uh, the public sphere and really trying to democratize the institutions of society. How do we produce a world in which there's a lot more democratic control over how we use our existing set of resources to um, transform human possibilities? And I think that that would require a really dramatic restructuring of society. It would require a very different understanding of the re relationship between law and investment, for example. Um, and, and it would open up many more positive possibilities for um, redressing the harms in our society. For example, you know, directing large parts of our um, productive capacities towards redressing both um, in the countries that we live in and globally, uh, reparations for, um, for slavery, reparations for colonialism and imperialism, uh, trying to use global resources in a fair and just way to both mitigate and adapt to um, and try to reverse in whatever way we can climate change. The need to take public control and democratize that control over investment is something that I think, you know, I'm, I'm sort of hoping will be something that comes more clearly into view and will shape maybe some of these discussions about the emergent or possible relationships between law regulation and investment um, and kind of trying to defeat the, the way that investment decisions, which really are the main thing shaping our lives, um, the way that those are controlled by a very small number of people and motivated by profitability. And, that, and, and, and the way that that's so limited with respect to the many different ends uh, that we have, the plural, you know, in a pluralistic um, or possibly pluralistic 
uh, future world. So I don't know, trying to trying to bring in a few different ideas there. But um, I, I'm finding what the other panelists are saying so stimulating. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's a really fascinating conversation. Great. I, I, would anyone from the audience want to chime in for a few minutes? I have one last big question for everyone, but we could take a couple of comments, questions. But someone would need to either turn their camera on and shout it out. Uh, or write me. All right, well, we have one question, which is actually uh, is putting gender back at, at the front, which I think is good because most of you have touched upon it, but we haven't uh, had a chance to discuss in detail. So um, the question uh, is, we've heard a fascinating discussion of care work and the gendering of this work. Um, do you see significant differences in how racialized and in Juan's words, heteropatriarchal pandemic, I guess it would be, so I guess this would be how racial capitalism and heteropatriarchal pandemic capitalism has impacted workers in a quote, male gendered industry such as construction? The question went a different direction than I thought. Anybody want to jump in on that? And that that comes from Sabrina Barton at the Rappaport Center, um, who has is uh, bringing that up in large part because we've been doing a lot of work with construction workers. And there she is. Um, can I just say something really quickly? Yeah. Um, so I, I don't know about construction much because I don't study uh, construction, but I think it's, you know, one of the things, and I forget who said it, one of our, one of my uh, fellow panelists said, just thinking about his, I, I think it was Adele, talked about the, thinking about historical specificity, right, um, and the way that various kinds of markets, various kinds of sectors of capital function. One of the, the you know, one of the ways that I write about gender in my book is just thinking about how many of the companies that, that I write about in terms of logistics have used gender as a way to create precarity for women uh, within the workplace. Um, and I spend a lot of time talking about that in, in my writing. Um, and I think it's critically important and, and to, to talk about that in terms of the workplace. But of course, I, I think as, as Pravda was also saying, like to understand how gender works within these systems uh, outside of the workplace is equally as important to think about. Um, but I, I'd love to hear more about the construction piece uh, because I think it's hard to make those kinds of broad statements without understanding the specificity of uh, particular market logics that function within these economies, right? And so construction, logistics, I don't know how similar they would be, but they definitely create these very specific relationships between gendered bodies uh, and the workplace, but also the way that that functions in the in the realm of social reproduction. Sabrina is making clear she didn't mean to limit it to construction, but um, but thinking about I guess other areas outside of of care, um, Adele. Yeah, so I, I, um, like Juan, I haven't um, focused my research on construction, but it seemed an awfully interesting way to bring in the migration parallels as well. So I, I would be interested in learning where you are looking. But when I think, you know, Catter, for example, or if I think uh, about um, the extent uh, to which uh, the work in uh, 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 you know, movement uh, Filipino men uh, into an industry not unlike care work that is seen as located in the places to which the workers uh, travel and they, they, they carry uh, or are recruited and carry with them uh, the uh, understandings 
over time that are historicized about the nature of, of that work, um, then you wind up um, uh, uh, with, a, with a really important opportunity to think about the way in which uh, core features of identity um, are operationalized within an understanding um, of capitalism that, that sorts and that frames and that conditions the kind of work that people do. And I've immediately drawn examples of uh, cross-border migration. But if you're thinking in historicized ways, uh, um, uh, including about colonial patterns, you'll, you'll also think very carefully about rural urban migration for construction, for mining, for similar industries and the ways in which uh, the gendering and racialization combined to allow certain kinds of practices uh, that are deeply exploitative to be normalized. Right, to be inscribed on in the bodies of the people who do that work. So, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of saying the, um, I think, well recognized point that um, uh, analyses of uh, uh, that take uh, gender and race uh, seriously in relation to how we understand markets, um, understand that this operates. Um, across uh, uh, across genders um, and we, we get an incomplete picture if we don't take very seriously um, the work that is racialized and and gendered male right. I know that prob is asking some of those questions in her work too and um, I but I what but we, we have six minutes left so. I can't, this is on beyond the future of work. Um, so I do wanna end with a future of work question, which is really about um, the need, like how do we need to, get, do we need to get beyond the discourse, the way we talk, we talk about it and maybe just ask you all, um, I mean, if you, I'll just ask how might you imagine a future of work and livelihood? Um, that is not likely to become a repetition of the past or present. Um, if that feels too utopian, you can change it however you like. Um, but uh, why don't we start with Aaron on that? Okay, well, uh, given very short time limits, I'll just say that um, in my view, you know, the real task that we face is to um, to create a world in which people are not insecure, basically. And that requires creating the kind of economy that meets everybody's needs without exception. And I think that that um, I think that ideas around universal basic income and universal basic services and different kinds of um, uh, struggles for that and movements for it sort of begin to get at this idea that we already have the capacity with the technologies we currently possess to provide everyone with um, the means of living a decent life universally and without exception. And that, that is just what it means to kind of um, respond to the, the demand for dignity of all human beings. And that that's the fundamental thing. And that the, the truly important realization is that doing so would require two other things. It would require first, a dramatic transformation in work because many people only go to work because they have to on the pain of starvation and expulsion from their homes and that doesn't have to be the case we can redistribute the work that there is to do we can make that work we can transform that work so that it is intrinsically motivating that it has a sense of purpose that people have autonomy that they can use and develop skills in their work and that those things actually can support uh, a vibrant economy that could actually meet the needs that, that people have while also providing people with a lot of free time to pursue their passions. And that finally, doing that would require moving away from a world in which investment decisions that shape our economy and society are determined by a very small group of wealthy investors. And that requires um, 
moving to a world where investment decisions aren't based on profitability, but rather based on something like a form of democratic and participatory planning. And I think that there's been a real revival of interest or beginnings of a revival of interest in this today. We live in a time, you know, in the, in the 1940s, we saw visions of full employment kind of, you know, um, uh, incorporating in, into the UN, the ILO, all of these documents founding the post-war order in the 1970s as that kind of, you know, went into crisis. It was unfortunately replaced with visions of a kind of neoliberal active society in which everyone would be insecure um, and subordinated to the market. And somehow that was going to revive the growth uh, that was lost and finally bring about um, development in the global south and equalize income and so on. And that was a huge disaster for the world. And now we live in a time of uh, new visions. People are talking about Green New Deals and about um, you know uh, new kinds of social compacts, and I think that it's really a time for visionary thinking about a possible world that really is a world of dignity, a world of um, satisfying and actually socially valuable work, and a world of um, shared participation in deciding where our resources go, not only to support you know. Um, the building out or, you know, producing goods and services, as it were, but also using our resources to support a lot of the demands we've heard here, demands for dignity, demands for visibility, demands for um, reparations of past injustices, both locally and globally. And I think that that is totally a viable future, a future for work that we can actually achieve in the 21st century. Sorry to go on a little um, now, thank you. And influenced in part by your work, the question was livelihoods too. And we've tried to keep that very much on the table um, throughout the pop-up. So um, we could maybe prop a Adele and we'll end with one. And um, there is a, there are a couple of questions in the chat now, but one of them from Ann Lewis, uh, you could fold into your answers if it fits, because it's, does the future of work include self-organizing of workers in unions or other structures. And you could fit that into the same question about, is it, does it look like the present and past? Prabha. And, and we do just have a, I do want to try to end no more than five minutes over. Yeah, I'll, I'll be very short. I just want to share something. I mean, you know, in the spirit of uh, sort of a positive, upbeat story, uh, and maybe it won't appear upbeat everyone. But I think last year when I presented my paper on you know, the laws recognition of unpaid work, it just felt like an obscure tort law story. Um, but actually uh, what has happened since is that in, in India, you know, uh, you know, an actor who founded a political party promised salaries to homemakers. And I think initially he was met with a lot of ridicule and people really thought, you know, well, what, this person is really, um, uh, you know, completely out of whack uh, with this proposal, um, and there was there was a lot of there were a lot of jokes about it. But actually, what happened very quickly was that uh, these were state assembly elections, and pretty much every political party, uh, rather than dismiss this newbie's idea, actually took it on board, and very quickly reformulated this proposal of salaries for housework into you know a range of policy proposals. Um, you know, whether it was pensions, whether it was minimum guaranteed income, whether it was gendered UBI, uh, not UBI, gendered basic income or uh, means tested basic income funneled through a female head of household. I mean, it's just this astonishing the range of proposals that came through from the political parties. And to be honest, the public discourse around it uh, was really between amongst feminists. I think feminists had the most disagreement over the proposal. So I just want to say that sometimes you know, actually the, the culprits may not be the political parties who seem to be corrupt and out of touch with people. They actually, even without doing any calculations on the proposal, uh, parties are willing to embrace it, not just to get votes. I don't think, I think we should take their political instincts more seriously. They actually found that when they went on the ground campaigning, they found that women either needed it just to buy, you know, a secondhand motorbike so that they didn't have to, you know, travel, take public transport, or to buy their kids, you know, branded T-shirts. I mean, whatever it was, uh, the cushion that that allowance, even if it was a modest amount, uh, made was was quite quite significant. Uh, whereas I think for the feminists, it was much more naturally a question of are we reinforcing gendered norms? So I think that was a very serious thing. But I think there can often be also elite resistance to sometimes quite uh, you know democratic processes of you know aligning. 
demands on the ground with policy makers who then uh, kind of you know operationalize it in law and policy. Yeah, and you can share the link to your website that has I found with a lot of the discussion about that, which is really fascinating. Um, if you want, Prova, uh, Adele. Uh, so thanks, I'll be super brief. Um, I was at a symposium last week on reparations under international law and Sir Hilary Beckles, vice chancellor of the University of the West Indies basically said, this is the century of redistribution. Right? And really uh, thinking that through and in the spirit of that in relation to care, I'd like to underscore Jenny Nadelsky's um, framing of how we might reimagine not just care, but our attachment to work uh, here. I hear synergies with Aaron because there is a deep undercurrent of how we democratize our relationship to the market. And that includes thinking very deeply about who should be doing the care work. And her answer is all of us. Uh, uh, a, a, a real uh, insistence on engaging with uh, challenging um, our acceptance that, you know, we, we talk about better pay, better this. Ultimately, if we're accepting that certain groups in our society will be attached to and subordinated in particular kinds of work, we are accepting the inequality. And it's a, it's a, it's a radical challenge uh, to that. So that's part of a framing. And the second coming that, so, so the, the re redistribution happens in the way we understand care works relationship to the market. Um, but uh, the north south dimension is very much about rethink, you know, we, 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 we frame our democratic understandings and our scope for redistribution in nation state frameworks that at their core um, maintain that same um, global inequality. Uh, uh, if we are seriously thinking about uh, redistribution, uh, we need to be thinking deeply about uh, the alternative spaces for imagining distribution. I've nodded uh, to the regional where I've spent a, a chunk of my work um, and uh, the social protection, the global so social protection um, uh, frameworks that flow through that. Interestingly, in this pandemic moment, there have been more calls for acknowledging that for a myriad of reasons. Um, and I, I, I think it's incumbent on those of us who are thinking about the future of work to frame or reframe that in terms of a, a thickened understanding of what social justice demands. Juan, you get the last word. Thank you, this has really been great. Uh, and I'm really honored to be uh, having this conversation with you all. Um, I think for me, one of the things that I've focused my work on is just how it's an incredibly difficult thing to do, but it's an absolutely necessary thing to do, which is to think complex, you know, in a very complex way, the ways in which the market, the ways in which the tenets of liberal democracy, uh, the ways in which the, the idea of what the human condition is, have all been sort of put into work, right? Uh, for the sake of capitalism. Um, and so we have this very complex system that expands not only within the workplace, but within society in general, that we really have to figure out how to undermine. So if we think about it, just the way that I write about um, technology is how technology has been used as kind of the hyper-rationalization of capitalist space. That the thinking about the technical fix as technology solving the problems of society, 
but they solve it, in, but it's in, incredibly, I mean, in, all the time, right? In terms of what we're thinking about, those problems and who asks the questions and what the problem is, is always at, uh, for the benefit of expanding and growing capitalism. That's my whole point at the beginning, we're thinking about pervasiveness and the continuing logics of capitalism. So technology um, has been continually, is continually used in order to fix um, society in place to fix social relations in place in order to uh, perpetuate certain kinds of uh, market economies. And that includes things like the state. And all of this is an oversimplification. Of course, it's more complicated than that, but it gives us a sense to think about how uh, in pervasive these kinds of, of systems are. So capitalism used to continually create better ways, more efficient ways in order to make bodies into producers of value that can then be accumulated by the capitalist class, right? So that's what I mean by the technical fix. Um, and so I think one of the things, and I think Aaron said this, is how do we reimagine work, right? How do we reimagine work into something that does not feed pandemic capitalism, right? Um, and to me, I think we have to, that means that we have to then create social infrastructures where workers, where communities that are not seen as workers, but in fact do a lot of work in order to produce society and to reproduce society, can imagine radical futures and can begin to build those kinds of radical futures that are not based on technology as being the fix, right? Or being used to fix uh, the accumulation problem for capitalists, where the state is not used to build the kinds of legal infrastructures and systems that then enable a certain kind of extractive economy to perform, where workers and people who cannot work or or don't feel like working because the only reason that they have to is in order to participate in the system of private property accumulation and acquisition is because they have to work in certain jobs, doing certain things because they need to, to feed that kind of system, right? And so I do think that unions are absolutely part of this uh, decision, uh, this process where people have to work. And so I write about how centering the voices of many of the workers that I've worked with has also said and, and shown us a way to think about social justice outside of the workplace because they don't just imagine themselves as workers, see? And so I think that even that, I think is part of thinking about a radical way to rethink how people see work in their life, right? They don't work or they don't exist in order to work. They work in order to exist. And that for me is a fundamentally problematic uh, relationship when we think about the human, right, and humanity, and what it means if we've structured and fixed in place all of these relationships in order to feed pandemic capitalism. Thank you. All right, we have radical futures to imagine ahead, um, and thank you all for um, helping us do that twice, not just once, but I'm glad you got to meet each other and talk to each other if you hadn't already. Um, so uh, that was even a better conversation than I fantasized. Um, so the, the folks, I should say, a number of people wrote me and said they weren't able to attend today and as, but they're gonna watch the video. So I think we've all sort of learned how to do that as time has gone by. Um, it's as important to sign up to get the video. So um, we will be posting these trying to get the turnaround in two or three days. Um, and so know that, uh, that many people will get to take advantage uh, of this discussion. And you're all invited to come back. Uh, that's everybody in this virtual room now um, who will join me in an applause uh, with in whatever way um, they do that. And uh, we look forward to seeing as many of you as are available for the Global Racial Capitalisms panel on Wednesday. Um, take care. <laughs>